many of you enjoyed the time of worship this morning? Man, God is good. Amen. Thank you, choir and orchestra. What a great job they're doing in here and uh, making the most of this facility. It's a challenge in sound and instruments and things in here. And God has uh, blessed our time in the tabernacle. So it gives us a lot to look forward to as we move uh, into the new worship area also. Hey, ha- let me ask you this. How many of you are glad you're here and not in a hospital? I don't know what to think about the rest of y'all, but half of y'all are glad, so I don't know, man. I'm thankful to be here. I'm thankful for God's grace and mercy and uh, thankful for what God is doing. So if you have your Bible with you this morning, I want you to turn to the book of 1 John, the third chapter today. 1 John the third chapter, we're in verse number 11. And John begins uh, the stressing in chapter 3 of what real love is, what God wants us to understand about his love. And one of the things I would say to you this morning that you have to kind of get in your mindset is uh, a lot of people get the wrong idea when it comes to love of who God is. And they get the wrong imagination of God. If something goes wrong in their life, they think God doesn't love them anymore. John's talking about today something totally different. And he's telling us this. He says, man, God loves us. You can't be more loved than God. But the question is, is do we love God? The question is not, does God love us? But do we love God? And so if you have your Bible, turn to 1 John, the third chapter. Verse number 11, would you stand for the reading of the Word of God this morning? 1 John, third chapter, verse 11. For this is the message that you heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Not as Cain, who was of the wicked one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his works were evil and his brothers righteous. Do not marvel, my brethren, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. He who does not love his brother abides in death. Whoever hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. By this we know love. Because he laid down his life for us. And we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoever has the world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him. How does does the love of God abide in him? So notice the question. How does the love of God abide in him? So John asked the question, how do we prove that we love God? Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you, Lord, for this day, your blessings, your favor, your goodness, your mercy, your grace. And I pray today the manifestation of the Holy Spirit will move in this place, Lord, as God, your word, goes forth. And Father, I know your desire is to teach us, instruct us, give us wisdom and godly counsel from the Word of God today. And so, Father, may we much be about your business. And in the name of Jesus, I pray that the enemy would be bound upon every corner. The Spirit of the Lord would have complete liberty and freedom in this place today. And in this place, Lord, we will draw close to God as God draws close to us. And this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. 1 Peter 1.8 says, Whom having we have not seen, you love. You've not seen God, but yet we say we love God. And yet in front of us is the proof all around us that God is at work. And the opportunity to love God and to love others. This is what John was stressing in this passage of Scripture. The true proof of the love of God in our life. That each time we look at love, we see the viewpoints that God is working in John to show us the staircase of heaven. As the writers would talk about John, they'd talk about how he building a staircase of of love towards God that we would learn the foundation all the way to the top of what God's love is all about. It is said about John from the great historians and writers that in John's old age, when it came time to go to church, they had to carry John to church and walk him in, uh, carry him in to the assembly. And when he got in the assembly, he would tell them, God loves you and you ought to love one another. And they'd say, John, is there any other message that you need to speak to us about? He said, no, that's the only message that needs to be told. 
that we love God and that we love others. This foundation is important for our lives. And the way John builds this case, he shows us in these words the proof that we love God. The first thing you're going to notice in verse number 11 is, is the proof that we've received the message of God. That is a message that you have heard from the beginning, the Bible says. The message that God is loved, the message that God so loved the world, and the message that we should love one another. It's a message that's been given to us from the beginning, and it's a message that will stay constant and absolutely through all eternity. God is love. So the first thing you've got to build in your life is the foundation, and know in your life, God loves me. God, you can't be more loved than the love that God has for you. And God so loves you, he proved himself in that. Now John writes back to us and says, how can we prove that we love God? Well, the first thing we do is to know is that we have received the message of God. Once you've received the message of God, it's important how you respond to the message of God. When God gives us a message, He gives us a message for this reason. He gives us a message to make adjustments in our life. He gives us messages to instruct us. He gives us messages so we can learn and grow. And when we receive that message into our life, that message that God has for us does a work in us that God is saying, God is speaking to you, He's changing you, He's calling you to adjust your life. Now this is what happens to a lot of folks. They walk in and out of here and they got so consumed with the world and man, they've got so many things going on in their life. Before the Word, and the message of God can ever get deep in their heart, the enemy has already distracted them and taken that word out of their life. Listen to how important this is. John is saying when you come into the assembly, when we are together, be prepared in your heart to receive the word of God today. Be prepared in your life. Have your Bible open. Take some notes. Underline some things. God has a message for you. When God speaks to us, we ought to be attentive, alert. And knowing God speaks to us, how we respond to that message means everything. It's not that we come and just hear we also become doers of the Word. I hear the Word of God, but then I react to what God has said. I put resolve in my heart today, God's going to speak to me. I put resolve in my heart today, I'm going to be in the assembly where God's presence is all around us because God says He loves to meet with His people. I'm going to be in a place today where God has a word for me. Have you ever thought about this? I walk into the assembly today and God has a word for me today. It's a message that's going to impact my life, change my life, influence my life, and I need to make adjustments to show God I really have received that word today. I'm responding to how God speaks to me. When I was a kid, my mother would ask me when she would say something to me, she would say this to me. She would say, now what did I say to you? What did I say? She wanted a response to know I had heard her and that I was going to do what she had instructed me to do. It usually meant for the betterment of my life. How many of you realize when you receive a word from God, it's for the betterment of your life? God has given us a word so that he can instruct us, teach us, comfort us, lead us, guide us, direct us. And when we receive that message, we respond to that message. It calls us to put action to the word. So think about this. When I come to church on Sunday, it's not me trying to get through an hour. It's me receiving the word of God. God has a message for me today. That's why I've got my Bible open. That's why I'm taking, that's why I'm taking notes. And this message hasn't changed from the beginning. God wants you to know he loves you. God is love and he wants you to love him and love others. And that message, church, is never going to change. It was from the beginning. It will be to the end. God is love. And John stresses that in his book. The other part to that is the response to that. And listen to this. This is where the enemy comes in. He distracts people. He gets them called off into other things that are going on in their world. And you come in here and you get your life all jumbled up with all kind of thoughts and all kind of things going on. You cannot hear what God clearly wants to speak to you. And that's why you've got to be prayed up, ready when you come to church to receive 
the Word of God. God is always sowing His Word into your life. So the proof that we love God is the proof, first of all, we're listening to God. We're hearing His Word. We're allowing God to speak to us through His Word. That's a proof we love God because we're willing to come under His authority of His Word and line up our life with what God is saying. So we receive it and we respond to it. Now, watch what He says right here. Then that same verse, God gives a mandate. In that 11th verse, this is great the way that John outlines this. In the 11th verse, he says this. He says, that, here's the message, that we should love one another. Now let me tell you why that's important. That's a mandate from God that you love one another. It's a command. Listen, there are certain places in the Word of God, and here is one, where God has strictly said something that there are no other options to. There's no plan B to love. Love the Lord with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. Matthew 22, 37 through 39. Jesus replied to them and said, you're to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. That's the first. That's the greatest commandment. That's the mandate from God. Love God. The second is to love your neighbor as yourself. To love God, then love others. It's the proof that we've heard from God and the commandment of God that we're going to follow the instructions of God of what he said. Now, look at the example John uses. In the very next verse, John goes all the way back to Genesis, the fourth chapter, verses 1 through 14, and tells about Cain and Abel, the first murder on the earth. Why is he mandating this? He's saying Cain and Abel came from the same family, heard the same instruction, and came two different ways from God. One received the message and responded. The other received a message and did not respond to what the message called for. There was no proof in his heart he loved God. There was proof in his heart he actually hated his brother. And why did he hate his brother? Because his brother obeyed. Because his brother did what he was commanded to do. Who instructed Abel and Cain on what to bring? Adam did. Adam gave him the message of what he had heard. Adam told him what had happened in the garden. He said, if you want to please God, this is what God has spoken. God says, bring a sacrifice. The blood is upon the altar. Repent of your sins, and God will forgive you of your sins and accept that sacrifice. Cain came and brought fruit and things of the ground, things that God had not called for. Listen to this, church. Here's proof that we love God. When we receive the message of God, we hear that message, and it's made mandated into us that if we really love God, we're going to do what God says. If you really love God, you're going to do what God's Word says, the way God says to come. Here's the difference. You can have a relationship with God or you can make a man-made religion out of it. You can do what God says or you can make up your own rules and then try to get God to love your way, your rules, your thoughts. This is what God's saying to us. God's saying, I've given you my word. Here's proof I love you. I'm going to instruct you. I'm going to lead you to correct you. I'm going to give you a word to receive. Now, when you respond to it, it's proof you heard the mandate of God. Do you love God? Then I would come God's way. Church, I'm going to tell you something. Religion's messing up a lot of people. We're coming our own way to God instead of obeying what God says. We're not listening to the mandate of God. If I come in my religion to God and do my own thing, I'm literally saying, God, I don't trust your word, and I don't trust the way you're doing it. If I come in my way, let me tell you what I'm telling God. I'm telling God that I've got a better way. I'm telling God I'm not interested in building a relationship with you, in hearing your word, in following your command. If I respond to God correctly, notice what the Bible says. Not like Cain, but like Abel. Not like Cain. I want to tell you this. Listen to me. Everybody look this way. Cain was not an atheist. He went to worship. He brought a sacrifice. He believed there was a God up there somewhere. Cain went to worship that day and walked through the religious walk that you could walk through. But he had not heard the message, nor did he respond to the message in the love of God. 
if he had received the message and responded to the message, he would have heard the mandate to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, to do what God has called me to do. And then when I know the love of God is in my heart, I look around and I know how to love others. Because notice what the Word says. The world is going to hate anyone who obeys God. Look at that next verse. The world hates you. And why does the world hate you? Underline it in your Bible. They hate you because you obey. They hate you because you love God. They hate you because you line your life up in a relationship with the holy God who loves you. Man, they hate you because you've disciplined your life to hear God's word and respond God's way. And you're not doing what everybody else is saying. You're not doing what everybody else is thinking. Let me tell you something. If there's ever been a day in our country where we needed to hear from God and obey God, it is right now. It is right now when you've got so much chaos going on around us and everybody standing and setting and kneeling and all these pledges and all these things. Man, we're living in a day where there's a lack of respect for the things that ought to be holy, godly, and righteous in this world. And we're justifying it in our own means. And this is what's happening. It is absolutely causing chaos. God is not the author of confusion. When God gives you His Word, it's clear instruction. When God gives you His Word, the proof that we've heard that Word is how we respond to that Word. How did that Word get in my heart? Look at what happened in Cain and Abel. What an example. Abel heard the same message that Adam spoke to his children, and he obeyed God, and he did not have the Bible. He didn't have a church sanctuary. He didn't have a Sunday school class, but he heard the Word of God, and he obeyed God of what God called him to do. And Cain came on his own means, his own way, and did his own thing. And church, I'm going to tell you this. And I want you to listen to me. The world's telling you, do whatever you want to do. Live like you want to live. But the problem is, the world can't answer eternal life. They can't tell you where you're going to spend eternity. The world can't give you a hope like the Word of God does. You want me to tell you why the world hates you? The world hates you because not only do we live with a purpose on this earth, but we live with the purpose of heaven. And we've received that Word and we've got eternal life. And because we know that, the world is jealous of that because they want another way to God. And forever and ages and ages on, people have been trying to find another way to God when God's already said, this is the way. This is the truth. This is the life in Jesus Christ. There is no other way unto God except through Christ. Every religion will offer you every way to get to heaven except they can't prove that's the only way. Jesus said, I'm the only way. And so when God gave you his word, he was giving you a promise. And he was saying, I love you so much. I tell you the truth of how you can spend eternity with me. And this is what the world does not want. This is what the world does not love. The world does its own plan. And so here's the mandate from God. The mandate is you love one another. You receive the Word of God. You respond to the Word of God. And if I respond appropriately, I respond in the love of Christ. Because notice what it says next. He said the next proof is the proof that we've received the motivation of God. Now I want you to look at verse number 16. Because this is a key verse here in the Word of God. Now let me tell you how important this is. Let, let me just say this. How many of you know John 3.16? That's not a trick question. You learn that from the very beginning of life. If you went to any Bible school or any Sunday school class, you learn, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believed in him will not perish but have everlasting life. Now let me ask you this. How many of you know 1 John 3.16? Hey, listen to this. Do you know what 1 John 3.16 is? It's right off of John 3.16. Man, how valuable it is when we say in our heart, God loves me. God gave to me. God wanted me to be in heaven. We know that verse. Look at 1 John 3.16. By this, we know love. By this, we know love. The response is, listen to this. For God so loved the world. Now look how John starts. By this, we know love. Look at the difference. Look at the contrast. How powerful that verse is. Okay, God, God, I love you. God, does God love me? Uh, God, I think you love me. God, I'm not sure you love me. God, I got this circumstance. I don't know if you love me. For God so loved the world. By this we know love. Y'all ain't getting it yet. 
I'll keep saying it till you get it. For God so loved the world. This now we know. We know love. Hey, I know God loves me. Why? God proved himself to me. God showed himself to me. For God so loved the world. By this we know. By what? By what God has done. Our, our response to this is I know what God has done. By this we know love because he laid down his life. He gave his only begotten son. Look at the verse. He laid down his life. Have you ever noticed how wonderful that is in the Word of God? For God so loved the world, this is how we know love, that God gave His only begotten Son, that He laid down His life. That God proved to us His love by giving His very best. What motivation? Listen, there's no greater motivation in all the world than love. Love is the greatest motivation. And so here's the proof we've received that motivation. So somebody says, well, I don't know if God loves me. God so loved the world. Well, how do I know that God loves me? Well, he proved it by laying down his life for us that we would have a relationship with him. He's proved himself over and over and over again to be faithful to us. And look at what the word says. And we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. And so what is the response here? Listen to this. If I receive the Word of God, if I receive the message, then I respond to what he's saying in verse 16. In verse 16, he's saying love is sacrificial. Love doesn't look to see how it can please you. It looks to see how great it can be expanded past me in the highest form, and that is to love others, to lay down my life and see God at work, to lay down my life before God as God laid down his life for us that we could be motivated to see right here, church, the proof we really love God. We love God. If we say we love God, then the mandate is we love others. Look at that word. If I really say this morning I love God, I want to ask you this. If you really love God, can you hate his church? If you really love God, could you hate others? If you really love God, could you hate his word? If you really love God, could you hate what he's called us to do? No, if we really love God, the proof and the motivation of God is that we're willing to be a sacrificial. We're willing to say, hey, not only do I know God loves me, but man, does God love me so much, he also allows me to be a part of being around other people, of showing God's love through me to other people and seeing what God wants to do in that. Here is the proof and the motivation of God. God said, I laid down my life. Look around you. You love God, you're going to love others. Because look at what verse 17 says. Verse 17 says there's a compassionate love. There's a love for others because if we hate others, we can't say we love God. But whosoever in this world has goods and sees his brother needs and shut up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? Think about this for just a minute, church. If that's a sacrificial love and that's a compassionate love, look at the way God puts that. Never in verse number 17. Does God say, I want you to enable someone to live in evil? That's not love. That's not compassion. To, to allow someone to stay in evil is not compassion. It's not love. God never loved us so much that he said, live, keep doing what you're doing. God loved us enough to transform us, to change us. And in that verse, he is saying, in verse 17, he's saying, love is not an enabler. Love is not go out here and look at evil and say, stay in your same condition, do what you're doing, let me fund it. That's not what that is. What he's saying in that is this. Now what says? Notice how clear he is in verse number 17. He said, if you got, if you got goods of this world and God has blessed you, and he knows, and sees his brother in need. Who's his brother? My neighbor, my, my brethren. My people here, the folks that could need a pick-me-up, a lift, an encouragement. What says? He says, if you see, that word see means to fix your eye upon him. Not to casually look or take a glance, church, 
But to fix your eyes, just like John and Peter walking into the gate beautiful at the temple in Acts chapter 3, and the man was laying there in need, and they fixed their eyes upon him, and God did a great work that day. I'm telling you, under the name of Jesus today, many great miracles are yet to be done when we fix our eyes upon where God is working and what God is doing and join what God is doing in this earth. Man, around us. There are people in need. And this is what we do a lot of times. We see the need, and then we go to somebody else and say, we ought to help them. You ought to help them. Listen, watch this. God laid it up on your heart to do it. The reason he had you fix your eyes upon it is because God wants to show himself through you. He wants to motivate His love into your life by showing you exactly what the Word of God teaches us. It, are, it is in these deeds, it is in these things that when we hear God, we hear that message, we hear God speak to us, we react to that message, that is the true love of God. And church, I believe that John is writing to us. He's telling us exactly what Deuteronomy 15, 7 says. When you look amongst your brethren in the gate and they have a need and God lays that up on your heart, then do it. Respond to it. You, God has blessed. You, God wants to use the blessing through. And it's in this where we prove we are motivated by the love of God to see that need and meet that need. It's the proof. That we've been motivated by God. Now, if somebody comes and tells you to do it, there's always the aspect of, well, I don't know if I ought to do this or not. I don't know if I ought to go that direction or not. But how are you going to say no to God? How, when God speaks to you, are you going to sit there and go, oh, I don't want to do that? Listen, you know when the Holy Spirit speaks to you. You know when the need is real and what God's led you to do. And the greatest stories written of our life are about obedience when we've just simply heard God and we've responded to that message. Look at the two verses. Love sacrificial. Love is compassionate. Love knows that God spoke to me. I heard the message. I responded to the message. I heard the mandate of God to love. And in that mandate, I was motivated by God to do what God called me to do. I heard the message. I heard the mandate, and I was motivated. All by, what's this? Not that, not that God loved me, but that I loved God. Look how that verse ends. This is the question we have. How do I know I love God? I heard his message. How do I know lo I love God? I've heard his mandate. How do I know I love God? I was motivated by the Holy Spirit to react. To respond to what I'd been given. That's how I know I love God. So maybe God's laid upon your heart something that He specifically spoke to you about. The greatest days of your life of walking in obedience to God. The greatest knowledge of knowing, not does God love me, but man, I love God. I love what He told me to do. I love that He motivated me in this direction. And I love God for what He's about to do. So every head's bowed. Every eye is closed this morning. Here's the proof that we love God. Father, we've heard your message. Here's the proof today we've heard God. We've heard your mandate from the beginning that we're to love one another. Here's the message today from God. Here's the mandate from God. Here is the motivation from God. This proves we love God. Father, in the name of Jesus today.